Cornelius, and thank you for joining me again today. Uh, today we're going to depart from the gospel according to Matthew and look at 3 John, a letter that is uh, very seldom preached on or talked about, but certainly worthy as scripture. Uh, we're doing this because yesterday in church, uh, we had baptisms as well as baby dedications. And so I wanted to talk about our children, and particularly children walking in the truth, which is our sermon title for today. Next week, we'll also have a uh, special message uh, that will be in regard to Halloween. Can Christians celebrate Halloween? And I think you'll enjoy that one as well. But for now, let us turn to 3 John, and we're going to look at the first four verses, verses 1 through 4, and it begins this way. The elder, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth, dear friend, I pray that you are prospering in every way and are in good health, just as your whole life is going well. For I was very glad when fellow believers came and testified to your fidelity to the truth, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in truth. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, as a pastor, people often ask me, Pastor, what is the most memorable time uh, of your life as pastor? And the answer I give is always the same. The most memorable, the most joyous time as pastor is when I've had the privilege and honor to baptize my own children, to see them come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, to profess faith before the whole church, and then go into the baptistry with me and be baptized. There, there's nothing more joyful than to see your children walking in the truth, as John writes in his letter. And I suppose that's true for everyone else, that they uh, find the greatest joy when they see their children or loved ones either married in the church or baptized or making their first communion, whatever your tradition may, may bring for the children, confirmation uh, in other denominations. But these sorts of milestones in their life as growing Christians is something that certainly brings us joy. And so it's not only our own biological children, but the children of the church in general. And so we as the church should find great joy and rejoice in the fact that these children are coming to saving faith. And that's our message for today. We should rejoice whenever children come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we witness the growth of our own church as well as the kingdom of God. So let's turn to 3 John in these four verses. And before I do, let's just get a little context, a little background on this letter. Now, it's called 3 John, so it's the third of the three letters that we have from John. It is from John the Apostle, though he never calls himself the Apostle here. He calls himself the Elder. It's been understood through tradition that this is John the Apostle, the one that Jesus loved. Um, he is writing to a friend named Gaius. Uh, he is the recipient of the letter, certainly someone who is a dear friend whom I love in the truth, he says, certainly a fellow believer, uh, and very likely a person who has some standing in the church. Now, his purpose is twofold. One is to encourage Gaius to continue in his good work as he supports Christian pilgrims who seem to be passing through his city. Uh, the other is to warn about a man named Demetrius who is in the church who is doing evil, and so John uh, has a twofold purpose here, but it's a very wonderful and loving letter. You can tell there's a great uh, relationship between John and Gaius, and he begins with just such sweet words uh, in these opening verses. And so we're going to take it verse by verse and begin with this first idea, which is loving in truth. Again, it says, the elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth who I love and the truth. What a warm welcome that is. So the word truth is important to John. He uses it six times in this letter, which is only 15 verses. He uses it 22 times in the gospel, according to John, which is more than the other three gospels combined. Uh, he says the truth will set you free, that your word is the truth, that we are sanctified by the truth. And of course, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ himself, is, are the truth. And so when John says, 
He loves in the truth. He loves in light of the gospel. He lived, he loves through the eyes of Jesus. His relationship with Jesus brings about his relationship with Gaius, and he loves him in truth. The foundation of John and Gaius's relationship is Jesus Christ. They're brothers in Christ, they're co-heirs to the kingdom, they're sons of the God most high. They are in Christ individually, and they are in Christ. Christ jointly. And this agape love that they share should be the distinguishing characteristic of all Christians because we all hold to the truth of Christ and his gospel. And this brings about unity in the church, this agape love. John 17, 20, 21 says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. All right, now that, of course, was Jesus talking in the Gospel of John. John also writes in 1 John 4, 19, We love because he first loved us. We love because God first loved us. So our love for one another as Christians, brothers and sisters, is a reflection of God's love for us. So the first question I would ask of you is, how are you doing with this? Are you loving in truth? Are you loving your Christian brother and sister in truth, in light of the gospel? Are you seeing them through the eyes of Christ? Is this how you're doing it? All right. Because if you are having strife, if you're having contentions, if you're having contempt for your brother or sister in Christ, you're not seeing them through the eyes of Christ. And so consequently, if you're not, how might you begin? Well, you need to refocus. Right? You need to refocus first your heart on Christ, understanding that he has forgiven you of your sins. And now that we have been given such a great gift, we must give that gift back. And we give that gift to our brothers and sisters first and foremost. And we love them as Christ loved us. We've got to get our eyes fixed on Christ and then see our brother and sister and Christ in them. And in this way, we can love in truth. Now, when it comes to the children of the church, we need to really love them in truth. We really need to see those kids through the eyes of Jesus. I mean, you read the scriptures and you know how Jesus loved the little children. And so we must love the children as well. All right, sometimes people get annoyed with the children. In the church, they're noisy. They might be disruptive. You should be happy that the children are in the church. They are the next generation. And, and they are the ones who are going to carry on when we're gone. And so be blessed and be happy about the children in the church. That's how we need to see them. And then we need to support them. We need to support them financially. We need to support, support them in prayer. All right? The children's programs are vastly important. We've got to continue to disciple these little children. I talked about that last week where we need to bring them up from immaturity to maturity. And we need to do this. This is the role of the church, to disciple our little ones. All right, so if we do that, and if we're true to that, then let's go on to verse 2 and talk about prospering in the truth. John writes, Dear friend, I pray that you are prospering in every way and are in good health, just as your whole life is going well. All right, there's a couple of things I want to talk about this. John continues, Wishing well to Gaius in prosperity and health, and this is a very normal thing to say in a letter, particularly somebody who you care for deeply. But there are three phrases, three words I want to focus on. And the first one here is translated as prospering in every way. All right. Euodeo is the Greek word. It's a compound word from the Greek word you, which means good, and odost, which means the way or the journey. Uh, and so you're, we hope you're having a good journey. We hope you're having a good trip through life, essentially. So we might say today, life is good. All right. We would say life is good. When we talk about prospering here, we're not talking about financial prospering. We're talking about just living a good life in all things, it says, in every way in my translation. In all things, I hope that you're having a good life, a good walk through life, a good journey through life. All right, it's kind of a big banner statement to begin with. And now John breaks it down into two specifics. He goes on and says, um, and are in good 
health, according to my translation. That word is hygieno, all right? It's where we get the word hygiene from. It means to have good health, good physical health. So the first thing that he says under this big banner of prosperity and everything is, one, I hope that you're getting along healthy, physically healthy. All right, and certainly we would want to wish uh, well-being on our friends and loved ones. And then he uses that word yuodao again, but this time he says in his suke, suke, which is the word where we get psyche. When we gen generally think of our mind as our psyche, but psyche in Greek is the spirit or the soul. So uh, yuodao suke is that you're getting along well in your spirit, in your soul. So first he addresses the physical health of Gaius, and then he wishes him good spiritual health as well. And John's wishing these uh, physical and spiritual health as a result of living in the truth, right? Gaius lives in the truth, and by living in the truth, hopefully he is experiencing physical health as well as so uh, emotional health or, or spiritual health. Now, in our parlance these days, we might say clean living, right? Have you ever heard that phrase, clean living? How is it that you're going along so well? Well, clean living, right? Take care of my body. I take care of my soul. I eat well. I exercise. I avoid drugs, alcohol, and tobacco, and all those sorts of things. I, I, anything that would be harmful to my body, I try to keep it out. I put the things into my body that are good. I have clean living. All right. And then alongside of that, with my healthy spirit, I'm in prayer. I'm in Bible study. I'm going to church. I am uh, communing with the Lord in my own way. But these are all the things that keep me well and healthy, both physically and spiritually. And so John is wishing this on him, this clean living. So then the next question for you, do you feel as if you are prospering in the truth? All right. How do you feel physically? How do you feel mentally and spiritually? If you're not getting along well, then maybe you need to reevaluate what you're doing. Are you not eating well? Are you not getting enough sleep? Are you not uh, exercising? Even moderately, get out and go for a walk. It's good for your body and it's good for your soul. And then along with your soul and your spirit, are you in regular prayer with the Lord? Are you reading his word? Are you fellowshipping with other believers? Are you receiving discipleship? There's just so much that we can use to feed our body physically and feed our spirit as well. And then how might we apply these things to the children? How can we help them? Right? So from a physical perspective, make sure they're getting exercise. Make sure they're eating right. All right. All those things. I have six children. I know what this is all about. It's a struggle, but we do our best to raise up our children to be physically healthy. Then we also want them to be emotionally and spiritually healthy. And so we give them opportunities to share and talk and be together as a family. One of the most important things that we can do as a family is sit around the family dinner table and be one unit, the family. And of course, that's a great time to pray as a family. Pray before your meal, right? Maybe have family devotions, let the children have their Bible study. Let the children come to church, have children's church, if that's what your church does. Whatever it is, keep the children active just as you would keep yourself active. But you need to set the example. You need to set the example of good, healthy, physical living and good, healthy, spiritual living as well. All right. And with all of that, we will then see our children walking in the truth. And this is the last two verses we'll look at. But John writes, for I was very glad when fellow believers came and testified to your fidelity to the truth, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in truth. And boy, I can tell you that's a true statement, right? I have no greater joy than to know that my children are walking in the truth, that my children are walking alongside of Jesus Christ, pursuing him, growing in him, maturing in the faith. There's no greater joy for me as a father than to see my children love the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John ends this section with this exclamation that there is no greater joy than seeing the children, his children, walk in truth. Now, 
Gaius is not his biological child. That's okay. Uh, Paul refers to Timothy as his son, and he's not his biological son either. But they have such a close, warm relationship, it is like a father-son relationship. And so he refers to the children uh, or the adults of the church as his children in the church. And um, many of those likely he had led to saving faith in Christ. And there's no greater joy, he says, than to see them walking in the truth. Now, this word in Greek, peripateo, is the word that means walking. Walking around is really more literal what it says. But it's used often in the scripture as your journey through life, as you walk through life. And so he says there's nothing better than to see you walking through life in the truth. All right. In the truth of the gospel, you're living a life worthy of the gospel. And again, I can attest as a father that there's nothing greater than to see your child working, uh, walking in the truth. All the hard work that we have put in for our children, all the days and crying and prayers and joy and everything that's gone in that we've poured into our children pays off and we see them grow up in the truth and there's no other joy that we get. And we, we feel that way for our children, but we need to feel that way for the other children as well, right? The children in the church, look at them the way John looks at Gaius. It's not his biological child, but he loves him as if he were his own. And so I encouraged the church on Sunday. I said, hey, you know, look at all the children we have in the church. Look at them as if they were your own and love them and find joy when they grow up in the church and when they grow and walk in the truth. We had baptisms yesterday. We had two uh, young people baptized, and then we had two babies dedicated yesterday. Uh, and so it was a great day. And then we had a gentleman come forward. He gave his life to Christ. He got baptized, too. It was just the most wonderful day yesterday. All right. So for us as a church, this desire to see the children grow up into maturity does not need and should not be limited to our own biological children. It should be for all the children. All right. And so today, or I say today, on Sunday, yesterday, we dedicated uh, a twins, Mac and Madden. Uh, and that should bring us great joy. Now, Mac and Madden are a fourth and, and, and their sister, Macy, got baptized. The fourth generation uh, within the church, uh, their great grandfather and grandmother came to the church. Their grandfather and grandmother now come to the church. Their mom and dad come to the church. And, and now they're being dedicated in the church. It's just a fabulous day to see that. And then the other young man who was baptized, uh, he's a first generation, but you know what? He may have uh, children and they have children and so on and so on to grow the church. And so we as a church should just see joy in that event. Anytime a child, anytime anybody comes to Saving Faith in Christ, but the children is just something that touches our heart. And so I encourage you that when you're in church next time, you see the little children, just let a joy come over you. Let a joy come over you that these children are growing up in the church and you can support them through prayer and through your giving to the church and maybe volunteering for the programs. Because it's always hard to get people to volunteer for the children's programs. So get out there and do the work. And above all things, rejoice. Rejoice and be encouraged that God is growing your local church through those little children, and not only your church, but the entire kingdom of God. I'm David Judge, pastor at First Baptist Church of Cornelius. I look forward to talking to you again next week. But for now, rejoice. Rejoice in the children who are coming to saving faith. All God's people said amen. Bye-bye.